Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 2, Bacterial Physiology and Genetics. We'll talk about the bacterial life cycle, its oxygen metabolism requirements, and different ways in which bacteria transmit their DNA from one to another. Welcome to Module 2 of the Microbiology Online Review for Falcon Physician Reviews. We'll be talking about bacterial physiology and genetics. This first figure is very important for step one as it describes the unique replication and growth curve found in bacteria. What you do, starting with the left hand side on the bottom, you have a line that, will, that rises up to a hill and then falls back down. That flat line in the initial stage is called the lag period. This is where a bacteria gets in and it has the essential nutrients it, it needs in order to make amino acids, vitamins, or coenzymes. And yet you don't see any increase in the number of cells because it has to build up the, the proper machinery for replication. Then you enter the log phase. The log phase is rapid, explosive, exponential growth, where there's tons of replication going on. This is where bactericidal, bactericidal antibiotics work best. If the world had an unlimited amount of resources, bacteria could quickly overcome everything and rule the world. But fortunately, things live in finite amounts and bacteria often will then reach a stationary phase. They've plateaued. They can't use any more of their natural resources to build up more enzymes, and so they're limited by the things they need to replicate further. That's where you also start to get the production of acids and toxic materials, and we, we stop our lag phase. Finally, as we've completely depleted all the resources available, the bacteria start to die, and they enter the slow death phase with time, where there's less and less numbers of bacteria available that are viable. This is different than the way eukaryotic cells divide and it's an important it's an important fact that's tested on USMLE step one. Frequently you'll find questions on step one that test the different media for each bacteria. So this is high yield. I'll briefly go through each organism and the media it's frequently grown on. For carini bacteria you'll often grow it on Loeffler's coagulated serum medium. You can also grow it on telluride auger, and it'll form dark gray or black colonies. Enteric bacteria frequently go on, grow on EMB, or eosine methylene blue media, and they'll make different products which will distinguish the colors of the colonies on each plate. McConkie auger is also frequently used for enteric bacteria, and lactose fermenters, it'll help distinguish between lactose fermenters and non-lactose fermenters. The intestinal pathogens are often grown on hectoin enteric auger or xylose lysine deoxy chocolate auger. Legionella is a bacteria that's frequently grown on charcoal yeast extract auger or CYE auger which has cysteine and iron. Mycobacteria are grown on Lowenstein Jensen media. They take a long time to grow. It contains egg yolk and antibiotics to suppress non-mycobacterial growth which often happens. Neisseria, if you get it from a sterile site, uh, or also Haemophilus, can be grown on chocolate auger. But if you get Neisseria with the normal flora, you need to get it with Thayer Martin selective media, which will let the Neisseria grow and not the other bacteria. Vibrio cholera likes an alkaline growth medium, and it's grown on thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose media. Anaerobes are often grown in thioglycolate. There are special growth requirements which are high yield for step one. Mycoplasma in specific needs cholesterol and purines and pyrimidines in order to replicate. Some of the zoonoses like Francisella, Brucella, Legionella, Pasteurella, but not Bordetella require cysteine. Haemophilus is an interesting bug. It requires both factor X and factor V. Factor X is the protoporphyrin and factor V is NAD. Influenza and Aegyptus require both factor X and factor V. Factor X is, for, is supplied by blood in blood auger plates. Bacteria can also be divided based on their oxygen utilization requirements. In the first group you have obligate aerobes. These bacteria require oxygen. They have no fermentation pathways and they generally produce superoxide dismutase. Examples of obligate aerobes include mycobacteria, pseudomonas, bacillus, nocardia, and carini bacteria. Some bacteria are microaerophilic, where they can grow in oxygen, but they require just a low amount and not full oxygen tension, about 
Examples of this include Campylobacter and Helicobacter. Facultative anaerobes will grow in air and they'll respire aerobically until the oxygen is depleted. Then they ferment or respire anaerobically. Most bacteria fit into this category, especially the Enterobacteriaceae group. Aerotolerant anaerobes have an are anaerobic bacteria which tolerate the presence of oxygen at least for a short period of time, like actinomyces. And finally, you have the obligate anaerobes. These bacteria are killed by oxygen. They have no superoxide dismutase. They lack catalase. They, use, they frequently are fermenters, and they cannot use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. Examples of this group are Bacteroides, Clostridium, Prevotella, and Propionibacterium. There are a number of medically important anaerobic bacteria, and they're frequently tested, so we'll go over them briefly. Spore-forming rods, which are gram-positive, include the genus Clostridium, which is Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium difficile, Clostridium perfringens, and Clostridium tetani. Non-spore-forming non -spore rods of gram-positive type are Actinomyces, Bifodobacterium, Eubacterium, Lactobacillus, and Propionum bacterium acnes. The gram-negative non-spore-forming rods include Bacteroides fragilis, Fusobacterium, and Prevotella. Non-spore-forming cocci of gram-positive type include Peptostreptococcus, and gram-negative you have Velionella. Now let's do a question which helps us understand the log and lag growth phase of bacteria. If a culture is inoculated to a density of 3 times 10 to the second cells per milliliter at time 0, it has both a generation and a lag time of 10 minutes. How many cells per milliliter will there be in 40 minutes? What you have to know for this question is how long it takes for a generation to reproduce. And so you also have to know the lag time. Since we have a lag time of 10 minutes, the first 10 of those 40 minutes counts as nothing. So then you have three 10 minute spans, in which case you double your population. And so your, your initial group of three times 10 to the second doubles at the first generation to 6 times 10 to the second, and then 1.2 times 10 to the third, and then 2.4 times 10 to the third, which is answer B. So what you need to know is that there's a lag time in there where no replication is taking place, and that takes 10 full minutes of the 40. The next question. A new laboratory technician forgets the iodine fixation step in a gram stain of Streptococcus. The organism on the slide will A. Wash off B. Appear pink C. Appear blue, D. Appear colorless, uh, or E. Lice. This takes us back to the gram stain we talked about in Module 1. If we don't have the iodine fixation step, then we don't precipitate the crystal violet inside the bacteria. Therefore, everything's going to wash out. Now, the bacteria are not going to wash off the slide, but they will be there and they will appear pink, like gram-negative bacteria. They won't appear blue or colorless because you still have the saffron and to color, and they won't lice. Let's talk about bacterial genetics. There are three types to remember. First, you have transduction, conjugation, and transformation. These concepts are frequently tested on step one. And you'll have to remember them. Transduction, you'll need to remember, is carrying DNA from one cell to another via a bacteriophage. This figure illustrates transduction and its two possible outcomes. On the left, you have a little bacteriophage which sits on the bacterial cell wall and injects its bacteriophage DNA into the new bacteria. The donor cell is infected with the bacterial phage, and there are two possible outcomes. If the phage is virulent or lytic, the phage will replicate and cause the cell to lice, and many new phages will be released. You'll have to note in the picture that one of the phages contains the bacterial DNA, so that's another way that bacteria mix their DNA up. The second possible outcome is when you have a temperate phage. This phage doesn't cause cell lysis, but the DNA integrates into the bacterial chromosome and changes the properties of the cell. This is called lysogenic conversion. Specialized transduction is important because lysogens can carry genes which aid in bacterial resistance to antibiotics. They also can carry toxins. If you have a prophage which integrates into the bacterial chromosome, it can then be inducted. Note, the cell doesn't normally lyse. It's not a lytic phage. So lysogenic conversion is where lysogeny can convert a non-pathogen into a pathogen or it can increase its virulence. Examples of this are the Tox gene, 
which is transferred by phage for Carinobacterium diphtheriae, or the pyrogenic or erythrogenic exotoxins found in Streptococcus pyogenes. Induction is where various treatments such as UV light destabilize the integrated prophage and then it induces a lytic phage replication. Conjugation is the second type of bacterial genetics we need to talk about. This image shows the F pilus which we're going to talk about as it changes from one bacteria to another. The figure on this slide shows that there are two bacteria. In the far left, the top bacteria has the F pilus gene, and the bottom bacteria does not. It's F minus. The gene is indicated by the circle around the F+. Plus. Through conjugation, the F plus bacteria makes a cytoplasmic bridge to the F minus bacteria, and the DNA is replicated and transferred through the F pilus. After the cytoplasmic bridge goes away, both bacteria are F plus. They both have the plasmid for the F pilus. You can see here how it's easily that bacteria can transfer some DNA from one to another, and so you can efficiently change antibiotic resistance genes, or toxic genes, or pathogenic genes. Sometimes in conjugation, the F pilus gene, or the gene that's transferred, undergoes high frequency recombination and integrates into the, into the bacterial genome. When recombination occurs between the F, plasma and F plasmid and the bacterial chromosome, it creates a high frequency recombination cell. Therefore, it's now integrated into the bacterial genome. The third form of bacterial genetics is transformation, which is basically the acquisition of naked DNA. The classic experiment is with pneumococcus, where there were smooth colonies which had a capsule and were virulent, and there were rough colonies which lacked the capsule and were not virulent. In 1928, Griffith mixed killed smooth colonies and alive rough colonies, and he found that the rough colonies soon became smooth. This is illustrated on the following slide. We have a donor cell, which is lysed, and the DNA fragments are released. And then the DNA can cross the cell membrane into a different bacteria and integrates into the recipient DNA. Therefore, we get rough and smooth strains of pneumococcus. Next, we'll talk about normal flora. These are bacteria that live in our body all the time. Most of the time, they don't cause any disease. It's only when our barriers are broken down where they can become opportunistic. On the skin, the biggest offender is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Other less important organisms include Staph aureus, Carinobacterium, and various Streptococcus and anaerobic species, and some yeast. In the nose is a major reservoir for Staph aureus, and so your MRSA people are going to swab your nose to see if you have any MRSA in your nose growing there, not causing problems. Other less important organisms include Staph epidermidis, Carinobacteria, and various Streptococci. In the mouth, you'll have viridin strep. You'll also find other streptococci, staph aureus, and klebsiella. In a dental plaque, you'll frequently talk about streptococcus mutans. Gingival crevices are known to hide various anaerobes, like bacteroides, fusobacterium, streptococci, and actinomyces. And in the stomach, you'll see lactobacillus and helicobacter pylori. Moving on to different parts of the body, the throat is the normal flora for viridin streptococci. Less important organisms include various other streptococci, like strep pyogenes and pneumococcus. The Neisseria species live in the throat, Haemophilus influenza, and Staph epidermidis. The colon is home to Bacteroides fragilis and E. coli, also lots of other of the Enterobacteriaceae. There's Clostridium, Bifidobacterium, Eubacterium, Fusobacterium, and others. The vagina normally holds, holds Listeria, E. coli, and Group B streptococcus. These are important forms of neonatal meningitis, and they're the things that are frequently tested in pregnant mothers before they deliver. You'll also find various streptococci, various gram-negative rods, bacteria fragilis, and carinobacterium, and candida albicans. The urethra usually is sterile, but you can find staph epidermidis, carinobacterium, and various streptococci occasionally. You'll get transient colonization both of the skin and the gut with Pseudomonas aeruginosa usually occurs in about 10% of people. Group B step and E. coli are important colonizers of some women that may cause neonatal meningitis and septus, sepsis. Let's handle a question. An 18-year-old male presents with complaints of dysuria and a purulent discharge from his urethra. When questioned, he admits that he does not practice safe sex and has had multiple partners. 
you suspect that he has gonorrhea. Culture on which of the following growth reagents would confirm this? So to answer this question, we have to know what causes gonorrhea. We know that it's Neisseria gonorrhea, and we know that if we have Neisseria from a complicated or a complex specimen, like from the urethra, you're going to have lots of other bacteria there. And so you want a selective media for Neisseria gonorrhea, which you're going to find in Thayer Martin selective media. Question number five. A four-year-old female presents to the emergency room with a sore throat and a fever. Her parents are concerned because she has not had anything to eat or drink for 36 hours. They also report that she has not received all of her childhood vaccinations. And I'm going to stop right here and tell you, anytime you see that, you know that the bug is something that we normally vaccinate against. So that automatically limits your choices. On, phys on physical exam, you note cervical lymphadenopathy and a grayish film on her palate extending to the tonsils. When you try to obtain a swab sample for culture, the underlying mucous membrane begins to bleed. What's the causative agent of this girl's infection? All right, so we have a clue that it's something that people are usually vaccinated against. So we have all of the options here except for D are things that we're frequently va vaccinated against. The other thing we have is the entire clinical presentation. We've got a sore throat, we've got lymphadenopathy, we've got a grayish film on the palate. When you tear that off, and when you put that together, it means diphtheria. And we're going to have to be familiar with that clinical presentation in order to get it to answer this question. It's not Bordetella because they'd talk about whooping cough, and it's not Haemophilus influenza because you'd talk about more of an epiglottitis. Okay, next question. The causative agent of the young girl's infection in the preceding question is an agent that encodes a potent exotoxin, which is acquired through... So again, this goes back to our bacterial genetics we just re reviewed. We remember that Carini bacteria obtained its exotoxin through transduction. That's something they're just going to test you on and you're going to need to know about. But now that we have this course, we can know the answers. Next question. A term male infant is delivered vaginally and without complications to a 23-year-old preemie gravida. While examining the baby at 36 hours of age, you notice that he's tachycardic tachypnic, lethargic, and febrile. The mother informs you that he has not been feeding well and becomes irritable when touched. Analysis of CSF fluid reveals elevated white blood cells and protein. The most likely organism is. So now we've got a newborn who apparently has neonatal meningitis. He's only 36 hours old and he's irritable when you touch him and he's not feeding and so we know something serious is going on. We suspect that they probably got it from his mother because he hasn't been up to any trouble in his 36 hours of age. So we think about common, normal flora of the vagina, and that's going to lead you to group B streptococcus. Let's recap Module 2. We talked about the growth cycle, the lag phase, the log phase, and the death phase. You'll need to be familiar with that as it's frequently tested on Step 1. We also talked about classifying organisms based on their utilization of oxygen, and that's important to know which bacteria go into which section. Finally, we talked about bacterial genetics and the ways at which they transfer DNA from one to another. Being familiar with trans transudation, conjugation, and transformation will be important for step one. Next up, we'll go to module three, bacterial pathogenesis.